morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're watching from. Thank you so much for joining us in a time of celebration of music and word. I hope that you all will enjoy as we do this together. Let's go.
for my sake and for your sake. And there's no other way to live life than to follow Jesus. He's seen the end from the beginning. He knows your life. In fact, his plans are better than anything that you could plan for yourself. And so right now, we just want to say, Jesus, you're the one I follow. I don't want to follow my instincts. You're the one I follow. So if there's anything that's holding you back from letting it go and saying, Jesus, you're the one I follow, you can lay it down. Jesus, you're the one we follow. Thought that I could do it. Thought that I could make it. Thought that I could build it on my own. But I've come to see that as I've tried to fill the void, nothing else can fill the hole. Feel full.
it is not because we understand the whole picture but we know that you are a good good father and so we choose to put our trust in you oh god so be magnified in all situations be glorified in the good and the bad times and it's in the name of jesus we have just worshiped and the people of god say Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are catching us from. It's such an incredible joy to have you with us today at Mavuno Church Online. Karibuni sana, welcome. Whether it's your first time, whether you've been here before and you're a regular, I want to welcome you. It's a real, real uh, pleasure to have you with us today. And I tell you what, every week we have people watching us from all around the world and what we want to encourage people to do just so we are able to serve you better is there's a link on your screen just click on it uh, or, or just fill out that link uh, it leads you to a place where you can tell us where you're watching us from we'd love to know so we can know how to serve people uh, better wherever they are so welcome i also want to invite us this week we'll be having family night it's our time of teaching and instruction it's an incredible incredible time it's the highlight of my week and let me tell you it can be the highlight of your week as well it happens every wednesday 5 30 to 6 30 east african time it happens on our mavuno church facebook and youtube channel so you can check us out mavuno church org on youtube you'll be able to catch that i want to welcome us uh to uh family night and don't forget we, we meet every single morning, every single weekday morning. It's an incredible time just of faith building and just praying together because God calls us as people to pray together. So morning prayers happen every single weekday morning, 4.30 to 5.30 a.m. Once again, East African time. Uh, the link is on your screen. You can, you can just grab that link and be able to join us starting tomorrow and throughout the week. But you know what? In this part of the world, I don't know where you're at, but in this part of the world, the rains have started. The rains have come. It's a joy for many people. It's maybe not a joy for some, some people as well, but it's interesting. Because when the rains come, the people who are the most excited are those who have planted. And if you plant uh, healthily, then what you're looking for is what? It's a healthy return, isn't it? Because the more that you sow, the more that you reap. In fact, that's exactly what God's word says to us. Because God's word says to us, let me just get the passage of scripture. God's word says to us in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 to 8, it says, remember this, whoever sows, sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Then it goes on to say, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Why? Because God loves a cheerful giver. I love this time of giving because it's my time of sowing as well. And God encourages us to be those who would be cheerful in our sowing, cheerful in our giving, so that one day we'll be able to reap a harvest from it. So let me invite us now. The details are going to be up on your screen, however you, you, you want to give. Please do take this moment and give. Father, we thank you now for your children. We thank you, Lord, for their faithfulness and for their generosity that goes towards building the work of your kingdom. I pray, oh God, the Lord, uh, you would allow every single one of them to come every single week with something to be able to give to you for the sake and for the purpose of your kingdom and growing your kingdom. And I pray that, Lord, as they do so, the Lord, you would bless them, that they encounter blessing in their life, whether it's material or in other ways, that, Lord, you would be good to them. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, whatever part of the world it is, whatever time it is, wherever you are, what an incredible joy it is to have you joining us today at Mavuno Church Online. Welcome to Mavuno, the home of the fearless on this wonderful, wonderful day today that the Lord has made. Hey, my prayer for you today is as we hear God's word, that your ears would be open, your eyes would be open, and your heart would be receptive, and you would say, what does the Lord have to say to me today? So, 
what about we get right into it today? So I want to start with a question for you as we uh, kick off this message today. And my question is quite simple. It says this. Can you recall a cartoon, a cartoon series that you enjoyed watching as a child? Now, for some of you, you may, you may need to think far back, but can you remember any cartoon that you enjoyed watching as a child? I'll tell you mine. It might, it might date me a little bit, but mine was a, a cartoon called He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. Now, this cartoon revolved around this little kid. His name was Adam, Prince Adam, just an ordinary young man. But this guy, every time he, he encountered some, you know, some magical powers, as you know, the, the cases in many of these this cartoons, he encountered some magical powers and he had a sword and he would pick up his sword, lift it up and he would say these words that have never left my mind. I have the power. And with that, he would transform into this like hulkish superhero and his little, you know, he had a little, little uh, pet, pet tiger that was a toothless, scaredy tiger. He would point at it and it would become this mighty battle cat. But I've never forgotten those words. I have the power. They have stayed with me for many years. And I think I enjoyed those words. I have the power when I was a child. Because let's be honest, I hardly had the power. I had the power to do absolutely nothing. I could not choose when I woke up, when I went to bed, what I ate, what I, you know, what I, what I enjoyed, what I didn't, how I dressed. There was somebody else in my house who had that power. And she was the real superpower in, you know, when I was a child. But I wanted the power growing up. And that phrase, I have the power, still resonates with me, even as an adult. And I think it resonates with many of us today. Because you know what? We look at ourselves. We look at our skills. We look at our potential. We look at everything inside of us and we say, I have the power to become something. I have the power to become someone. You know, if, I, if I'm able to maximize my skills, become the best version of myself, work hard, apply myself, I can accomplish great things. I have the power. We have the power. And we look at the next generation. We look at our kids, our nieces, and our nephews, and we look at them and we say, they have the power. They have the power to become anything that they want to be, anything that they put their mind to. They have the power. The power is within them. Now, Many of these uh, phrases and thoughts, or rather, many, many, there are many thoughts and phrases that echo these sentiments. I have the power. Today we say this, the power is within me. We tell ourselves, I am limitless. You may remember this one from a couple of years, a couple of months ago, actually. Every human is unlimited. And you can have, become, and do anything that you want. And today, everyone from self-help gurus, motivational trainers, you know, HR practitioners, uh, pop culture icons are all telling us the same thing. Hey, the potential is in you. All you have to do is activate it. You have the power. Now, you know, as I've grown up, I've been asking myself, what does it actually mean? What do these thoughts and phrases mean? What, what, what is useful from them that I can glean and kind of apply in my life? But are there any things lurking in the shadows that I need to be aware of? Now, if you've missed, you know, part of this month, we've been doing this series throughout the month. And the series is called Two Truths and a Lie. And throughout the series, we talk about the catchphrases and the ideologies that we see, you know, swimming around popular culture, many of which have entered into our cultural lingo and our cultural consciousness. And the question we are asking ourselves is, how do we interrogate these phrases to know what they mean and what their impact is? We began the series, we talked about speak your truth and what that means. We talked about YOLO. You only live once. And last week we talked about this thing for do what makes you happy. Let me just encourage you, by the way, if you've not caught the entire series or missed any of them, go to our Mavuno Church YouTube page. You'll catch all of them. It's a rich series. And I'm certain it'll be a series that blesses you. But today, we want to focus on this one particular phrase. I have the power. Now, this phrase and many of these phrases came about uh, as a result of what they call the human potential 
movement. And this is a movement that arose around the 1960s and developed around the concept of maximizing the untapped potential that may lay within each one of us. This became the precursor to yet another movement, and you may know it. It's the self-help movement. Sound familiar? Self-help movement has been going around for the past 40 years or so, and it's focused on one thing, improving self. The, the belief here is that there is immense good in every human being. There is such good in every single one of us, and what we need to do is tap into it. If we can unleash it for the sake of the world, oh my goodness, the world will be different. But secondly, encapsulated within it is this thought that with human potential, if we tap into it, we as humans have the ability to solve any problem and lift the world out of the mess that we find ourselves in. We have the power. You have the power. Now let me just say, many of these phrases sound incredibly noble. Even godly, I, I, you know, I have to admit. Because even scripture in many ways resonates with a lot of these thoughts. Think about it. If, if we say that we were created in the image of God, wow, we must have the power. Surely, if God breathed his very breath into us and the life that's coursing through our veins is that that God himself breathed, surely we must have the power. You know, uh, Psalms 8 and 5 tells us that we were made a little lower than angels. Hey, tell me you don't have the power. Psalms 82 reminds us that we are God's sons of the Most High. Wow, we have the power. But I wonder, I wonder if this is the full story. I wonder if there is more to it than meets the eye. In a moment, what I want us to do is take a look at a group of people in the scripture who began to encounter their potential and their power and what lessons we can glean from them. This story is told in the book of Genesis chapter 11, and we are going to read from verse 1 to verse 8. And it says this, Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinna and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we can make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But, but the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, if as one people, speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. And he says, come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. Verse 8, so the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth and they stopped building the city. That is why it is called Babel, because the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Now this story, we colloquially refer to this story as the Tower of Babel. And as the, as the story happens, the people are kind of spreading out across the earth. And this group of people settles in a place called Shina, which was Babylon or modern day Iraq. Not Iraq, eh? Iraq. And they begin building. But it's interesting because God seems quite displeased with them. And he comes down personally, yeah? And he scatters their work. Like he comes himself and he scatters their work. And I ask myself, why did God do this? Now, I see at least two reasons, at least two reasons for this. For the first one, we have to understand the context of what is going on around this time. You see, way back in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, so we're going back to the beginning, verse 28, God's charge to mankind is quite clear. He says this, be fruitful, fill the earth, and subdue it. He reiterates this again a few chapters later in Genesis 9 and verse 7. I love it in the CEV version. It says this. God says, I want, your sorry, I want you and your descendants to have many children. So people will live everywhere 
on earth. Now, God's intention was quite clear here, that humanity would spread out across the entire earth and they would take charge over all of it. However, note that by this point, there's a rebellion that's already brewed in the hearts of men. Uh, and God had brought a flood prior to this passage that we read. And he wiped out many people, leaving only a handful of people. And now God comes a second time and he tells these people, I want you to spread out over the entire earth and to fill it and to subdue it. But have a look at what the people's response in verse 4 to God's word is. Their response is this. They say, come, let us build ourselves a city. Otherwise, what do they say? We will be scattered. We will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Man, instantly, we see rebellion and the disobedience of humanity. What does God want? God wants them spread out over the entire earth. But they don't want to. They don't want to be scattered. So the first thing is that they sit and they settle. And I'll tell you this. Whether it's in the Garden of Eden or right after the flood, regardless of the instruction that God gives to people, humanity seems to know what's best for itself. And it always seems to want to go its own way. And that's the first reason. But the second reason I see is encapsulated in the verses, we do chapter, uh, verse 3 and verse 4. It's interesting. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Verse 4 says this, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so we may make a name for ourselves. You know, it's curious that the materials used are actually mentioned. And the Bible actually talks about the materials they used and the ones they could have used <laughs> that they didn't use. Now, building technology is going to grow, is advancing now, and people have discovered brick and tar. And for the first time ever, the people are able to build something bigger and stronger than they ever could in the past. But even more important is that the materials they used were waterproof. That's interesting. You know, many historians actually believe that, that there was a reason that they picked the materials that they did, including, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, first century uh, or rather uh, ancient Jewish historian Josephus. He saw the purpose of this tower to be high enough that people could escape God's wrath in the event that he sent a second flood. Guys, in other words, there's a high chance that what they were doing here, what they were building here, was flood insurance. That's what they were building. Now, guys, was God opposed to their creativity? Was he opposed to, their, opposed to their ingenuity? Was he opposed to this, you know, advance in technology? Was he opposed to them, you know, discovering things and learning new things? I don't think so. He was, after all, their creator. And he's the one who made them the way that they are. He's the one who placed that potential inside of them. God, however, was displeased that they made plans that were in direct contravention to his instructions. What they were trying to do here is build something that would shield them from the consequence of their actions. You see, in the past, because God brought the flood and many people died, now they are saying, hey, listen, if he brings another flood, we need to be able to protect ourselves. And now they could live in disobedience if they wanted, but they could protect themselves. They were shielding themselves, but also they were elevating themselves to a place where they would not need him. They wanted to make a name for themselves. And at the heart of what they're doing is one very important word, self. They knew they could do it. They knew they had the potential. The power was in them. Now, this story sounds eerily familiar to one that we've, we've heard before in the Bible. And it's about a fallen angel by the name of Lucifer. Now, his name meant star of the morning. And he held a high-ranking position in the heavens. But he was not content with worshipping God. He wanted to be worshipped and he wanted to build a name for self. He wanted to build a name for himself. In fact, if you read Isaiah chapter 14... 
verses 13 and 14, I want you to look out for one word that is repeated over and over again. I'll kind of give you a hint as I read this passage. It says this, you said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zephon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high God. Do you pick it up? I'm sure I gave you more than enough clues. Obviously, it's the word I. Even though he existed in the presence of a great and glorious God, Lucifer wanted to make it about himself. You know, people call it the, the, the Luciferian trinity. You may have heard of it. It's me, myself, and I. And you know, after many years of being cast down to earth, I want to suggest to you that the enemy has devised a devious, devious plan. And his intention is to make God's people fall for the very thing that he fell for. The very thing that made him get cast down to earth. He wants you and I today to fall for the very same trap of I. And I'll tell you what, today, everywhere we turn, everywhere we look, we see me, myself, and I. We see I being advanced as a solution to all of man's issues. Listen to a couple of quotes by different people who have significant clout and followership that people listen to. Listen to what they have to see and see if you can pick this up. Will Smith, actor, he says this, Greatness is not this wonderful godlike feature that only the special among us will ever taste. It's something that truly exists in all of us. Christian D. Larson says, believe in yourself, in all that you are. Know that there is something inside you that is greater than any obstacle. The Dalai Lama says, with the realization of one's potential and self-confidence in one's ability, one can build a better world. Wow. Roy Bennett says this, believe in your infinite potential. Your only limitations are those you set upon yourself. And this one, Kenyan people will know it because it's one of our heroes, Eliud Kipchoge. He says this, if you believe in something and put in your mind and heart, it can be realized. Why? Because no human is limited. Oh, wow. All these sound so touching. They sound so motivational. I feel like I can do anything that I put my heart to. And that's exactly their thought. In fact, have a listen to this. This is a video a touching commencement speech given at Harvard University. Have a listen to this. But no matter what challenges or setbacks or disappointments you may encounter along the way, you will find true success and happiness if you have only one goal. There really is only one, and that is this, to fulfill the highest, most truthful expression of yourself as a human being. You want to max out your humanity by using your energy to lift yourself up, your family, and the people around you. Theologian Howard Thurman said it best. He said, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and then go do that. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. Wow. Did you catch that? People who have come alive alive. That's what the world needs. Now, allow me to just issue this uh, as a disclaimer. Because there's something incredibly beautiful about having inner strength. There's something wonderful about being able to maximize our potential. All these are God-given attributes and completely commendable, every single one of them. There's a challenge, however. The challenge is that humanity is increasingly seeing itself as a solution to its problems. And now, with, with our own effort, with our own potential, with our own striving, we too can reach the heavens, just like the people in the city of Babel attempted. And, and here's the thing. If you don't really need God to reach the heavens, if you don't need God to become all you can be, 
Hey, if you don't need God to help you, maximize your potential. Do you really need God in the first place? You see, all this is the beginning of what they call secular humanism. This is a philosophy that's sweeping across our culture that tells us that it elevates critical thinking, it elevates compassion, it elevates uh, moral and ethical reasoning and says these are the solution to mankind's problems. It teaches us that we can fix ourselves. It teaches us that all we have is a cancer that's growing inside of us. And if we, can be, if we can be better people, if we can work harder, if we can have more compassion, if we can max out our humanity, we will solve the problems of mankind. What this ideology subtly is doing is slowly but surely edging God out from the center of our existence. And it places us now in the middle where now we Make a name for ourselves. Just want to suggest to us that of all the phrases we have encountered this month, and we've encountered some, some powerful ones, YOLO, speak your truth, do what makes you happy. I want to suggest this may be the most prevalent, the most dangerous, and the most insidious of all of them. Because even though it may sound very philosophical, the reality of it is that many of us today live like the people of Babel. When it comes to the work of our hands, how we go about our lives, our relationships, and our marriages, many of us consciously or subconsciously become convinced that it's our effort. It's up to me. It's the work that I put in that will make things work. So I begin to spend time building my own tower. You know, this is why it's so easy for us to spend our days praying for good jobs, praying for clients for our businesses, praying for that spouse and praying for children. <laughs> but the moment we get them, the first casualty becomes all the things to do with our faith. The first casualty begins to become going to church, serving God, paying tithe, doing first fruits, all of those things. You know, it's because we're not completely persuaded that those are the things that are going to get us to where we want to go. So what we do is we begin to believe in ourselves. We begin to put the energy and effort into ourselves and the things that we are doing. It was a popular Kenyan artist, I'm not sure how popular he, he is today, called Juakali. And Juakali, many years ago, told us this, Nibidiangu. Now that's Swahili for it's my hard work. And the point here is, it's my hard work that will accomplish this. Nibidi yangu, and we believed him. And now, later on, we repackage this into another Swahili phrase. Mwanaume ni effort. A man is, is um, defined by his effort. These are fantastic phrases. Let me be honest. They are fantastic phrases. They have a lot, a lot of godly use, and, and they talk about hard work and a reliance on him. But the problem is when our reliance and dependency is removed from God, these phrases become so easily corrupted and they have become corrupted. You know, the enemy, he then proceeds to convince us that it's through the power of our own thoughts, not just our works, but also our thoughts that we can achieve greatness. I don't know if you remember, from about 2006 onwards, there was a book and a video, video series called uh, uh, The Secret by a lady called Rhonda Byrne. And she began to teach us, you can be the master of your own destiny. You can be the captain of the soul. And through the laws of attraction and the power of positive thinking, eh, positive thinking, you can become anything that you want to be. And today, whether it's the Landmark Forum, whether it's Silver Method, Life Spring, whether it's practices like yoga, all these embody these ideologies that are broken ideologies. And today, let me tell you, there's a ton of motivational speakers innocently teaching us these principles. HR practitioners and personal development gurus are bringing these trainings into our workplaces for one reason, self-development. Hey, there's that word again, self and you know, if you're on TikTok and social media, you may not be talking about the secret in 2023, but I'll tell you another phrase that we have begun to use in our cultural lingo, manifesting. Have you guys heard that one? I'm manifesting. 
It's a pop buzzword for calling out the things that I want to see in my life. Anybody out there feel like manifesting Dubai? Manifesting love in your life? Manifesting good grades? Again, it's up to you. You can make them happen because you have the power. At least that's a story that we are told. Now, going back to the story of the Tower of Babel. Now, here's the irony of this story of the people of Babel. Everything that they wanted, God wanted for them even more. God had an infinitely better plan than they had for themselves. If we read uh, the very next chapter, this was Genesis 11 we were reading. If we read Genesis 12 verses 1 to 3, we begin to see what God's plan is. Once again, look out for the repeated word. And I think it will be pretty easy to find. Genesis 12, 1 to 3 says this. This is God speaking to the people and he says, Go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I, God, will show you. I will make your name into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. I'm sure you caught it. This is now God saying, I. Now compare and contrast this with a passage of scripture we read earlier on. You know, the people of Babel wanted a city for themselves, but God wanted nations and the ends of the earth for them. They wanted to make a name for themselves today. God wanted to make a name for them for generations to come. God tells them, I myself will make your name great. I will make your name great. That's what they were after, making a great name for themselves. Later, in Genesis 26, verse 4 and 5, it says this. It says, I, again, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and will give them all these lands. And through your offspring, all the nations on earth will be blessed. Wow. Wow. Can you see? I don't know if you see it now. Why God had to come down and stop the work. He didn't come out of spite. He didn't come to punish the people. If anything, God came down out of compassion for the people. Because they were going to miss this incredible plan that God had for them. You see, left to our own devices, we miss out on the incredible plans that God has for us. When we put ourselves in the center, when we self become the star of the show, we miss out because God says, I have a plan for you. But many times I sit on the throne of my life because I have a plan for myself, which is nowhere as big as God's plan. I'm going to tell you this, and it's a one point of the message today. Again, forget everything else. Remember this. Outside of God, every human is limited. Outside of God, every human is limited. You see, the enemy's plan is this. It's to make you to fall for the very same lie that he fell for many years ago. It's the lie that you can do it. The lie that you are enough. The lie that you have what it takes. The lie that you can build a future for yourself and for the, your family. The lie that you have infinite potential, infinite goodness, infinite capacity. And all you need to do is just tap into it. And you can accomplish anything. He wants to feed your mind with a self, listen to this, with a self confidence in yourself with a belief that you can do it that it's your abilities your reliance your self-reliance he wants you drowning in popular culture and listening to voices that will that will that will you know build up this sense of self i can do it because the power is in you i have the power i am limitless now in what is known as the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives this sermon in Matthew chapter 5, longest sermon that he gives. And we call these uh, the Beatitudes in Matthew 5. And in the very first one, this is what God says. This is what Jesus says. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Now, another way of saying this, I, I heard this some years back. It's a different version. It says, blessed are the spiritually bankrupt. Wow, I love that. They're spiritually bankrupt. It's the people who realize that they are nothing without God. 
I'm the ones who come to the place where they understand even the little I have, whether it's my abilities, whether it's my relationships, whether it's my networks, whether it's the strength of my hands, whether it's my riches, that everything belongs to God. I am nothing. I am bankrupt on my own. Blessed are the spiritually bankrupt, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Remember this, outside of this God, every single one of us is incredibly limited. And let me ask you, why should spiritual bankruptcy matter to God? Now, I don't know if I've met someone who's gone bankrupt. You know, they reach a place of dependency. They reach a place where they realize they can no longer do it on their own. They reach a place where they are, they are open to hearing. They are open to listening. That's spiritual bankruptcy. Because it's only when you realize your bankruptcy before God that you can begin to live a life of dependence on him. You see the word blessed, when it says blessed are there, the word blessed in the Hebrew, sorry, in the Greek language, it meant more than just happiness or material comforts. It encompassed a much bigger thing about purpose and fulfillment. What Jesus would say to the people of Babel, and I suspect he would say to me and to you today is, do you want a life of meaning? Do you want a life of purpose? Do you want a life of contentment, real success? Then rely less on you and more on me. It's like John the Baptist said, John 3.30, he must become greater and I must become less. You must be cured of your self-reliance. You must be cured of this thing that I can rely on myself. And you must be totally and wholly surrendered. You see, all of us, all of us, without exception, want a name for ourselves. We want to build a future for ourselves. But what did it mean for us to surrender our desires to God and determine today to trust him? All of us are working hard to build something for ourselves. But listen to what, the, what David says in Psalms 127 and verse 1. He says, you're working hard. But he says, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. And unless he watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. My question as we bring this to a close to you today is this. Are you the one building your house? When it comes to your career, are you relying solely on your smarts, your intelligence, your efforts, and your abilities? Or are you inviting the Lord to show and direct you regarding how to go? When it comes to your work or your business, hey, have you surrendered it before the Lord? Have you invited his wisdom, his power, his divine ideas? Or are you working yourself to the bone from morning to evening, Sunday to Sunday, unable even to do church? So you sit home and do online church. I wonder. Yet this, the next verse that we, that in, in, in that passage from David, Psalms 127, now verse 2 says this. Listen, in vain you rise early and you stay late, toiling for food to eat. For he grants sleep to those he loves. In other words, you work yourself to the bone thinking it's up to you, but it's God who will grant you peace. He's on who will grant you that thing that we talked about, being blessed. Hey, when it comes to your marriage or relationships, is it up to you to make it work? Are you spending your days and your nights trying to fashion the person that you're with, trying to make them into the image of what you want them to become? Is it up to you? Are you struggling and toiling every day saying this person must become? Or are you surrendering it before the Lord? And are you saying, Lord, I invite you into this thing so that it's your outcome. It's not your work. It's not your effort. Mwanaume see effort. A man is not defined by his effort. We are limited. And we need to remember this. Outside of God, every human is limited. Let me tell you, where the world tells you you have the power to make and build your future, don't buy it. Don't buy it. Come instead to the humble acceptance that the only power you have comes from the almighty God. Hey, when the culture tells you that no human is limited, 
Come intentionally before the Lord and acknowledge your limitations. Write them down and say, Lord, here are my limitations in my relationships, in my business, in the work of my hands. Write them down and surrender them before the Lord. Hey, when you are tempted to believe that you can be whatever you want to be, if you just put, your, put work into it, hey, ask the Lord today to show you who you are and who he wants you to be. Ask him to invite, uh, invite the Lord to bless you and the work of your hands so that you can be what he wants you to be and not what the culture tells you you can be. I'll, tell, I'll say it one more time. Outside of God, every human is limited. I'm going to take a moment now and pray for us as we bring this to a close. Because I suspect there are people here who acknowledge that they have been toiling. They have been working hard like the people of Babel to make a name for themselves. They have been working hard to create and craft the future that they want. And maybe the Lord today would invite you to a place to say, early in the morning you wake up in vain. It's me who will give you what you're looking for. And the people of Babel didn't realize everything they wanted, God wanted for them. So if you're here today, you're listening to me or watching this and you're saying, hey, I, I resonate with this. And today I want to come to a place of surrender. To surrender my relationships, my marriage, my children, my business, the work of my hands and say, Lord, it's not my effort that will do it, but it's yours. I want to take a moment and pray for you. Let's pray together. Father, I want to pray thanking you for your word. Because I realize that even the shortest interaction with your word has the ability to change the entire trajectory of our lives. Thank you, Lord, that your word brings light and life into our situations. Where the, the, the world is speaking darkness, where the world is, is speaking all these different things that leave us in darkness, your word brings life and light to us. Father, I thank you, O oh Lord, that we don't have to toil. We don't have to work hard. We don't have to spend all our energy trying to build our towers and our lives, that we can rely on you. And that as we put in our work, you are able to multiply the efforts of it and bless it. Father, I pray for anyone who's out there today who would say, listen, I, I've been building. I've been doing this thing on my own. Father, I pray for them now that, Lord, you would bring them to a place first of acknowledgement that they have been relying on themselves. On acknowledgement, Lord, where they say, it's my skills that have brought me to where I am and it's what I'm relying on. Father, I pray, would you empty us of ourselves? Would you bring us, even as we listen today, to a place of great spiritual bankruptcy where we realize we cannot do it without God? And I pray for anyone who would resonate with this prayer right now, O oh Lord, that you would humble them and you'd allow them to begin to say, Lord, I invite you into my space, into my life, into my marriage. I want to stop toiling. I want to stop building my, my, my city and my tower. And I want you to be the one to do that for me. I pray the Lord as they make this prayer, the Lord, you would be faithful with your word and faithful to them. The Lord, you would be near them, close to them, that you begin to show them the way that you want them to walk. There are some here who are dying for some divine ideas when it comes to the work of their hands. As they surrender their lives, you are able to do this for them. Bring divine ideas over your children. There are some who are praying now and just saying, hey, in my relationships, I just, I, I feel stuck. I have worked and worked and tried to make them what they should be and I can't. I pray now that, Lord, you would show them as they surrender those relationships before you, that, Lord, you would show them and say, I can make your marriage what I want it to be. I can make your parenting what it should be. I can make your relationships what they can be. So, Father, I pray that even as we, we uh, surrender our lives before you, that you'll be faithful for each one of us. But I want to pray for someone who's out there as well. I want to pray for someone who says, hey, I've not even given my life to Christ. I, I don't even know. When you talk about surrender, I haven't even begun the journey of surrender. Hey, today, I sense the Lord saying, today is a day of your salvation. Today is a day of your salvation. And even as I say these words, the Holy Spirit is knocking on your heart right now. That's the conviction of the Holy Spirit saying, let me in. If that's you and you want to give your life to Christ because you've never done it before, or maybe you have and you've walked 
away from him. Would you say these words together with me? And all of us, wherever we are, we can say them in solidarity with these God's children. Say, Father, say it out loud wherever you are. Say, Father, I thank you that you love me. And I thank you that you have a good plan for me. I acknowledge that I have not walked with you or sought after your ways. But today, today I want to change all that. I want to invite you into my heart that you would be my Lord and my Savior. And starting today, I am yours and you are mine. In Jesus' name. Father, I pray for this, your sons and daughters, who today have made that prayer in faith, thanking you for them. Would you secure that word? Would you guard them against any work of the enemy? But would you now fill them with a sense of joy and a sense of peace because their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Hey, if you made that prayer with us today, I'd love to be able to hear with you, to hear from you. All of us at Mavuno are so excited for you. If you could just hit us up, if you could just go into the comment section, you could even write us an email, info at mavunochurch.org, or go to any of our social media platforms at mavunochurch.org and just drop us a message. We'd love to hear from you. And hey, if you're catching us from any of our viewing centers as well, I know that many people are catching us from viewing centers all around uh, the city and all around the world. Uh, there are questions that are going to come up up on the screen for you and the idea is take some time and just discuss these questions together and even if you're watching on your own just get a pen and paper write them down and just say hey what is God saying to me wow what a wonderful time we've had today I'm looking forward to closing the series next week two truths and a lie part five happens next week until then God bless you and see you next time